Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So today we continue our discussion on the Bhagavad Gita. So we move to the sixth chapter of the Gita. In the fifth chapter, what was the what were the main themes? Fifth chapter, which is it? Yes, yeah, so while both are good, but karma yoga is better. That there is delay and difficulty. It's true. Good point. Anything else? neglect our impulses and should act according to like bhakti yoga and karma yoga prefers according to the yeah, what you say that instincts yes yeah, true so basically the body mind is like a machine and rather than getting too worked up the problem is that the machine will work in its own way and if we are selective we don't have to go along with it completely we don't have to repress it completely but we have to select which is spiritually conducive uh, which is conducive for higher growth and in that connection we discussed about the one major topic yesterday was about fighting temptation. fighting temptation so what were the key things we discussed in that abstraction Abstraction. Apt for Sorry, apt. What is that? Abstinence. Abstinence. Persistence. Transcendence. Abstinence means what? Vairagya. But what does it mean? To detach from the. Yes, but specifically, what happens? When do we need that abstinence, especially? Yes. It's, it's a, what is the example for that battle? It is like. Yes, it is a timed arm wrestling match. It is not that the urge will be tormenting us constantly with the same severity so it will pass and then we can just tolerate it during that time that time abstinence and even if you are not able to have abstinence what can we do in the remaining time persistence so if we are strengthening ourselves then we will move forward so now <coughs> in some ways when Krishna is speaking if there is a question answer discussion going on then sometimes the discussion is directed by the question and sometimes it may be directed by the answer, by the teacher. The student's question may direct the discussion, sometimes the teacher's intention or teacher's plan may direct the discussion. So here now Krishna to some extent gives a glimpse of where he is planning to take the discussion towards the end of the fifth chapter. So. Because Krishna, Arjuna's main concern was the whole idea about uh, sh should I be engaged or disengaged, which is equating with attached or detached. So Krishna, towards the end of the fifth chapter, he gives a glimpse. So in the last two verses, the fifth, chap fifth chapter has 29 verses. So in 27 and 28, he basically gives a glimpse of Dhyan Yoga and 29 he gives a glimpse of Bhakti Yoga and this will be elaborated in chapter 6 and this will be elaborated from chapter 7 to 12 elaborate so some questions, some chapters begin with Krishna being prompted by some question from Arjuna but here chapter 6 does not begin that way Krishna continues talking about Karma Yoga. Now Arjuna still has a question. Krishna is repeatedly saying that, okay, engaged action is better. But then Arjuna lives in a culture where he has seen many renunciates, he has seen many sages. So he says that, he has that question in the mind that, is there never a right time for renunciation? Krishna has talked about premature renunciation. So, but isn't there a time for mature renunciation? So now, here he is talking about mature renunciation more in terms of Dhyan Yoga. Uh, that's what Krishna will be talking about. You remember, remember the paths? There is renunciation and there is detached action. So with respect to detached action, 
there is karma yoga and there is bhakti yoga now with respect to renunciation there is dhyan yoga and jnana yoga so krishna has spoken about karma yoga from chapters 2 to 5 now because arjuna has a question that what about that's not, that's an unasked question see sometimes when two people are close to each other when they are talking just by the expression on someone's face you can understand at least to some extent what they are thinking what is going on in their mind so the way krishna is going to go here is he is showing a trajectory that from karma yoga to dhyan yoga to perfection and then so this is chapters 2 to 5 and then chapter 6 and then after that this perfection he will actually describe is the stage of bhakti yoga or it is the stage of bhakti you could say more than it is the stage of absorbed devotion and then he will after that say that there is a if you consider this to be like a gradual path then there is a rapid elevator like path which is bhakti yoga and which can be practiced by anyone from wherever they are to the highest stage so this he will describe afterwards but he will in one sense let arjuna himself recognize the need for an alternative and then he will speak about bhakti yoga so generally speaking if we are given a medicine and if we don't have the disease then the medicine is not valued very much but if we have disease then the medicine is valued isn't it so sometimes we may give some good advice to someone but if that good advice is not relevant to that person then they will not take that advice they will not really value that advice so krishna one of the things that he does in the sixth chapter is he lets arjuna himself recognize how important it is to have an alternative to the path of renouncing as in the case of dhyan yoga so let's see how he does this now the key point is that what is the stage where one can renounce the old now here renunciation is more associated with in action mm-hmm. that is the broad idea of renunciation in action and disassociation disassociation means solitude in the path of yoga the renunciation is generally each yogi has a, as their own cave in which they sit and they meditate now oh, dozens of yogis coming together and performing yoga said that is a modern phenomena done more for fitness than for transcendence so this kind of renunciation where one gives up there is no action and there is no relation relation means relationship there is no activity and there is no relationship this is a demanding kind of renunciation and the key qualification krishna says that is required for this is the state of our mind so initially krishna starts by talking about the path of karma yoga and how one needs to be detached and then he says eventually when one wants to path practice dhyan yoga so there is a initial stage in dhyan yoga the technical word uses aruksha aruksha means the starting stage aruksha munir yogam karma karanam uchyate so here one practices karma karma means one does one's activity and at this stage now i'll not go too much into the yoga but broadly in when in this chapter when krishna uses the word yoga he is referring to dhyan yoga previously when he used the word yoga what was he referring to karma yoga 
so the meanings of words are dependent on context say if we go to a yoga the me- it's contextual meaning it is like if we go to a ayurvedic hospital and their treatment the it would be an ayurvedic treatment if you go to allopathic hospital the treatment would be allopathic treatment isn't it so contextual meaning is it's allo- so like that yoga has a contextual meaning so it's clear when krishna is speaking what he is referring to and arjuna gets it because the context makes it clear so yoga the process of yoga itself has eight broad stages does anyone know the stages yes so uh, yam let's try to understand these stages in terms of visualizing so first is okay let's move forward to this see it's like a gradual process of internalization of consciousness it's like a focusing and internalizing of consciousness so the first is yama and niyama now these are sometimes translated as do's and don'ts and that is a valid translation another translation of this is that there are individual rules and there are social rules that means how we function ourselves so for example a stay here don't steal that is a social rule how you interact with others then shaucha cleanliness that is a individual rule how we maintain our personal hygiene so basically the idea is that once our outward interaction when we are interacting with the outer world once that is regulated then gradually we can turn inwards say now if all of if all of us say during our morning meditation we sit now all of us first of all we find a reasonably comfortable position to sit so and now of course the comfortable position should not mean we go to sleep that is we comfortable so that we can focus on the meditation and then everybody else is also trying to meditate so there is individual rule is we find it comfortable so that we can focus the collective would be that if nobody chants too loudly nobody does any action that is distracting nobody talks on phone so there is the individual and social when it is there and gradually the consciousness can start going inwards then after that what is there after that asana, asana. so asana is basically then there is a physical posture so we sit in such a way that so yam uh, then we can that helps us the sometimes the word this is used as yoga poses or posture or even the word stands is used now the idea is that if in cricket a batsman is batting now different batsmen may have different stances but the idea is that when you are in the stance that is best for you and the ball comes you can hit the ball effectively so like that the body stance is meant for helping raise the consciousness so that is the ex- from external generally speaking most people it is very difficult to bring about a sudden internal change although internal change is the most important thing generally it's a outer to internal change in terms of implementation of the change like alcoholic may decide i want to give up alcohol but the first thing they may have to do is maybe remove all bottles of alcohol from their home you know if you are staying near a alcohol near a bar maybe you have to relocate so external changes then after asan there is pranayam so now here asana is more a regulation of the body now breath breath is often considered <coughs> to be the link between body and mind breath is something physical by which we can bring about a mental change it's like whenever a person is agitated you know say just take a deep breath take a deep breath so by taking a deep hare krishna welcome yeah chit mohan ro ki yeah so when we take a deep breath then what happens by that breath basically uh, 
that is a way by which the external can be used to calm the internal. So now these four, technically speaking, can be practiced while one is in the world. That means a person can have their job, a person can have their career, a person can be with the family. Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, they can be practiced. So Krishna is saying these are Rukshor Munir Yogam. So he's talking with this stage. In this stage, when in the first four stages of yoga, first four stages of yoga or first four uh, steps we could say, there karma is the activity, one continues action. And then after that, Shamaha, Shamaha is giving up action, inaction is the means. And this is called the Arudha stage. Arudha means one is well situated in yoga. If you consider yoga to be like a ladder, then one is at the advanced stage of the ladder, the Arudha stage. So after these first four stages are over, then gradually, see in these stages, what is the point? The point is regulation of external interaction of our interaction with the external world. So we are still interacting with the outer world, but it's very regulated. After this comes Pratyahar. Pratyahar is the place where one starts shutting out the external world. So when we shut out the external world, what happens is at this point, we are creating the tangible foundation for going inwards. And this is not something which can be practiced while one is engaged in the world. If, say, if I am giving a class, I cannot shut out the world. Is it it? If somebody is a manager of a temple, if somebody is a youth center, they say, you know, oh, I just, I and Krishna alone, I shut out the world. It's possible, but then don't be a manager. You can have your own solitary practice. So in general, once shutting out of the world starts beginning, that means that one has to actually turn away from the world. One renounces the world. Pratyahar. And then after that, there is increasing levels of meditation. Increasingly steady, steadier meditation. So one starts trying to connect with a deeper reality. So there is Dharan, there is Dhyan, Dharan, Samadhi. So each of these, now Samadhi is the final stage where one gets immersed. So it's a gradual focus, as I said, it's a gradual focusing and internalizing. And this is the final stage, a personage of Samadhi. So Krishna broadly outlines this process from, in this chapter, from 6.1 he is starting and he goes to outline this till 6.32. Now he does many things in between, but this is the broad outline of the yoga process. But gradually one turns inwards and then one tries to find out what is the deep reality within? When we meditate, what do we meditate on? That we'll discuss gradually. But the key point here is that this is a significant break. That from here onwards, one is disconnecting from the world. So when one is disconnecting from the world, what is required is that the mind be calmed, the mind be controlled. Now we may say the mind needs to be controlled all the time. We are living in society right now. Do we not need to control the mind? Yes, of course, everybody needs to have some level of control over the mind. However, for us, you know, we could say use the word mind management or mind control. 
Now both can be used interchangeably. Nowadays, I prefer mind control to other that we call. I don't prefer mind control because increasingly in the Western world, when the word mind control is heard, people think of not we controlling our mind. They think of others controlling our mind. They have the idea of mind control cults. So the, generally, the word mind control is associated with some manipulative leader. It could be a cult leader. It could be even the media brainwashing people, indoctrinating people. So mind control is associated with others controlling people's mind, our mind. And because of that, the word mind control does have a somewhat negative connotation. And another problem with the word mind control is that it conveys only one mode of dealing with the mind, force. That when you have to control something, means you have to be forceful. But even the Gita will say that well, force definitely has to be used. But force is not the only thing to use in controlling the mind. We don't have to be resourceful. We don't have to be forceful. When you are a manager, you have to be resourceful. Now, you can't use force all the time. A manager can't say for every single thing, if you don't do this, I'll fire you. If you don't do this, I'll fire you. So if that is a threat that a manager has to use all the time, then that's not a very effective manager. So similarly for us, so whether, whether we use the word mind management or mind control, you know, there are words whose meanings change with time. Like Prabhupada himself would use the word cult. Very frequently, the cult of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is spreading all over the world. But if somebody today asks us, so are you a part of the cult, a cult? Will we say yes or no? no? No, because what has happened is the word cult has nowadays acquired a very negative connotation. So cult refers to a group of people who, uh, who, are, com who are brainwashed and manipulated and they, are, they can often be dangerous to society or dangerous to themselves. So that is not the connotation that Prabhup Prabhupada had in mind at that time. Cult meant only a group of people. So the meanings of words keep changing. Like I said, 30, 40 years ago, the word gay just meant cheerful. I went to a gay party. Now today, if somebody says I went to a gay party, <laughs> that will raise some questions, isn't it? At least the normal meaning would be very different for people. In the Western world, the idea of a of a brahmachari ashram is it's very strange for people. It's like if it's the idea of men living together, their idea is it must be a set of homosexuals. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's a it's a bit of weird context in which sometimes people interpret things. Of course, Catholics have their monasteries. In Christianity, there are two groups: Catholics and Protestants. So Protestants don't have any monks. Uh, Protestants, they have only married priests. Catholics do have still um, monks. But unfortunately, the Catholic Church has been beset by a lot of uh, child abuse scandals and things like that. But anyway, the point I'm making is the word mind control is very much used by Prabhupada and it is a perfectly valid word to use. But it can trigger some negative connotations in people's minds today. But the point is, either way, whether we use mind management or mind control, normally, for most of us, mind management is both an individual and a social. Uh, mind management is done both by individual responsibility and social arrangement. What do I mean by this? Say like all of you are sitting over here. Now each of you has chosen to come here. And then you are going to focus on hearing. That's why you have come here. But at the same time, <coughs> at the same time, say if you are a little tired and you feel sleepy. Now, if say you are sitting alone in your room and say hearing this on Zoom, then if you feel sleepy, what will happen is, okay, let me nod off for a few minutes and then few minutes will become many minutes. And sometimes many minutes become many hours also. Isn't it? But the, so the point is that when our mind gives us some urges, say if you have to eat food, 
if you are eating with others then even if we like that food we may not over eat too much but if you are all alone then suddenly the bakasur from inside comes out <laughs> so basically for all of us certainly the individual responsibility always has to be there for taking care of the mind for managing the mind but to a large extent the social arrangement <coughs> helps us regulate our mind and this is not just for spiritually minded people or devotees even in normal materialistic society society helps people keep their minds impulses under check you know if a person is even a materialistic person and they are working in a company and they are having a meeting and there is a disagreement now even in the company there is a certain code of conduct in the middle if you are in a company meeting you are angry with someone you may feel if it's outside of the streets you may swear at that person or punch that person in the face but in a company board meeting if somebody starts doing like that then probably that will be the last board meeting that they attend isn't it so in general society helps us keep our minds impulses under check not all the impulses and not all the time it also depends on the kind of association we are getting so in some so some societies so say even if people go to a party where people are drinking see even people who drink look down at people who get drunk <laughs> see that means you should, their idea is you get dr- you drink but don't drink so much that you know, we have to carry you home out <laughs> you have to regulate yourself so <laughs> so the idea is that every social circle will bring certain amount of regulation now of course as i said if it's bad association then some of the bad tendencies may not be regulated in that but even bad association requires some regulation it is that the thieves may want to deceive but even thieves don't want that other thieves deceive them that you know thieves want that we should be honest with each other we can deceive everyone else but we should be honest with each other so the point is that any kind of social group that we belong to brings a certain level of regulation of the mind so we could say social group that any kind of and mental regulation if we say now if the group is tamasic then you could say it is the least regulation if the group is sattvic it is much greater regulation but in general if we are alone then there is no external deterrent for us to stop acting out on our minds urges and because of that if somebody is to practice solitary meditation then their mind needs to be at least in some level of reasonable control that's why krishna says that our mind now now that is a universal principle but krishna is talking about the mind over here in this chapter the mind can be both our friend and our enemy now while it can be both and it can be both even when we are alone or when we are in association like even in association sometimes our mind may get a urge yell at this person and we yell at them sometimes you know, five minutes we yell at someone that can destroy a relationship that we have built over five years so the mind can be destructive anywhere but if we are alone the destructiveness of the mind will have no social check to it and that's why krishna says when can you renounce the world when your mind has been reasonably checked my your mind has become reasonably calmed and what is the cause of the agitation of the mind that the cause of the agitation of the mind 
basically in this world there are always going to be dualities and like we discussed earlier so this is we could say this is just the physical reality of the world <clears throat> physical reality means sometimes it's going to be heat sometimes it's cold sometimes the ac is going to be on sometimes the ac is going to be off <laughs> sometimes there is going to be praise by others sometimes there is going to be insult by others disrespect by others sometimes there is going to be success sometimes there is going to be failure so these dualities are going to happen now in one, one world cup final in india may lose another world cup final india may win so the dualities keep happening so when this happens quite often our mind tends to exaggerate the dualities so whenever something good happens it becomes elated and whenever something bad bad happens it becomes devastated so <clears throat> it is krishna says the test of our mind having calm down is that amid dualities it stays relatively steady this color is the mind stays relatively steady there might be a little effect but not much effect and how does this happen practically when we say how will the mind stay steady amid dualities so that requires this is now see if somebody wants to know what does spiritual growth mean now, this is one image that can convey what is spiritual growth see there is in general the material in our life if we are just if we are still materialists or we could say we are not materialists we are spiritual starters so at that time what happens is for us the material is very big and the spiritual is very small now as we grow spiritually what happens is the material becomes small and the spiritual becomes big now within the bhakti tradition if you want to talk about it as the bhakti we could say material simply means this world and the spiritual means krishna so god the spiritual or god so when the material means the world so the idea is that for all of us in the initial stage of life the what happens in the material world matters a lot and okay i have a relationship with god but that's okay it's okay it's like when i started sharing bhakti when i was introduced to bhakti i started talking about it with my relatives so my uncle he said that, yeah i believe in god he is happy there i am happy here <laughs> <laughs> so it is like god is so small as to not be very relevant so if the world is really what is big for us that any change in the world will have a big effect on us if god is what is big for us then any change in our relationship with god that is what will have a big effect on us if the world is small for us then it won't have that much effect it's not that the world becomes uh, non existent the world is still there and the world still matters but not so much that means say krishna will say that with respect to things and with respect to people we need to have an equal vision equal vision means when sama loshtrashma kanchana he says that that gold and stone and pebbles the wise person the spiritually serious person the person who is capable of renouncing the world should be able to see both of these equally so now this is quite difficult 
most people will think that if you see stone and gold equally, you need to go to a mental hospital. <laughs> uh, and yes, it is possible that some people who don't value things, they are not really mature. But it could be that somebody has seen beyond. So when the spiritual has become so important for us, that the material doesn't matter. So how can a person stay equal amid material gain and material loss when there is something bigger in their life and they are focused on that. Only then they can stay equal. It's like say, you know, we are in a room with two people and one of them is very important for us and the other person is just a casual acquaintance. Now, if I am dealing with two people, so this is a casual acquaintance and this is, the other is a very close friend. Now, if the casual acquaintance, if this person uh, say speaks harshly, Maybe disrespects us, insults us, or this person speaks harshly, which will affect us more? Sorry? Both. Close friend, yes, isn't it? Yeah, you know, okay. Anyway, we will be concerned why this speaker is speaking so harshly, even if it's a casual acquaintance. But if that is not a serious relationship, okay, you know, people like women go through their own things, and I don't really care. It's that so it, now in this case the effect on us would be okay we might feel a if say we might feel a little bad we might feel a little bad and then move onwards but if somebody is close to us that hurts us we will feel really bad is it because that relationship is important for us so similarly when Krishna is saying stay equipoised amid happiness and distress. Stay equipoised amid honour and dishonour. What that is indicative of is that the world has become not that important for us. That in this world honour and dishonour will come. But it is my spiritual growth that is the most important thing. And when one has come to that level, then one can renounce the world. So then what is going to happen is, basically this is our response to dualities at the material level indicates how much our mind is attached to material things. In general, you see, um, how do, okay, let me put it this way. How do we know that there is attachment or there is no attachment? So attachment basically is a multiplier of emotion. Attachment simply is said to be whenever we are attached, our emotion associated with the situation, it gets multiplied. Say if somebody is a little interested in cricket, okay, India win, that's nice. But if somebody is completely fixated with cricket, India wins. You know, I have to celebrate, I have to dance, I have to party. And if somebody else is not ready to party, what's wrong with you? <laughs> it is like that. So, it's generally the greater the attachment, the stronger is the emotion. So, if there is detach, we could say multiplier or maximizer of emotion. On the other hand, detachment, if there is detachment, then it's a minimizer of emotion. Okay, that's happened. So, okay, let's move on. It's like that. So, generally speaking, here, the dualities will be very high. Here, the dualities will be very less. So, in one sense, by the dualities that we go through, we can trace backward and we can understand our attachments. So, whose words affect us a lot? That indicates whom we are attached to. Now, attach can be a, attachment can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing, it depends. Which things affect us? That indicates who we are attached to or what things we are attached to. 
So what Krishna is saying is, if our mind is attached, then the mind will still keep going up and down, up and down. And it will not let us be peaceful. And till the mind has not come to the level of equality, you could say non-duality or being non-affected, being unaffected by duality, till that time a person, it's not very safe for them to practice solitary renunciation. Now after speaking this, then Krishna will start the process of describing the path of solitary renunciation. So, let's look at one of the verses from there and we'll try to understand what is going on. So, here, if you see Krishna in one verse, he describes the externals. Chucha udeshe pratishtha, they stay in a clean place. And Atmanam Rahasistita, Rahasistita was in the previous verse. I think. Atmanam Rahasistita, Rahasistita is basically be situated in a private place. So, let's look at this verse, 10th one. Yogi Yunjit Satatam. Yunjit means engaged. So, yoga is the yogi practitioner, Yunjit is the engaged. How? Constantly. It's not a, okay, for this person, it's not a casual 10 minute stretch yoga asana that you do every day. It is a serious practice. Yogi Yunjit Satatam. Yogi Yunjit Satatam. So, Atmanam Rahasi Sita. Sita is situated. So, that person is situated, one, one takes one's own self and situates it in a secluded place alone. Atmanam Rahasi Sita. Atmanam Rahasi Sita. And then is describing, after describing the external, then he starts describing the internals. Ekaki. On one point. Yata Chit Atma. So our chitta, our consciousness is fixed on one point. Ekaki yata chitta atma. Ekaki yata chitta atma. Then nirashir. There are desires. Desires come generally when we are affected by dualities. That, oh, you know, this is wonderful. I want it. This is dreadful. I want to avoid it. But nirashir. One is free from desire. And aparigraha. One does not have too many possessions. Because when there are possessions, then there is worry. How will I protect this? How will I protect that? And that will distract the mind. Nirashir aparigraha. Nirashir aparigraha. So together, Yogi yunjira satatam Atmanam rahasi sthita Ekaki yata chitta atma Nirashir aparigraha. Now, in this particular series of verses, Krishna uses a particular way of explaining the stage from there is uh, the sadhak, there is the seeker, and there is the siddha. Hmm? You could say the seeker and the seer. So, what Krishna does over here is, he first starts from 10 to 15. He describes the seeker moving to the seer. Then again, from 16 to 23, he describes the same journey. And then again, from 24 to 32, he describes the same journey. Now, what is he doing by this is, he is describing different aspects of that journey. So, when one is moving on the spiritual path, at that time, what all do we need to take care of? So generally, when we go on a journey, uh, what all is involved over there? So that is that sh shapes this particular description. So in the first series, in the 16 to in the 10 to 15 series, Krishna is primarily focusing on the journey from the physical towards the internal. His emphasis is much more on 
okay how should you sit how should you keep your eyes focus on a particular point like that and the description of the internal is very brief now in this case krishna starts itself by the point of regulation and then there is a detailed description of the experience of samadhi okay it's like you are going on a journey what all do you need to take care of when you go on the journey that could be one description another could be okay what will be your experience at the end of the journey what will you experience you will feel so thrilled you will feel so delighted you will feel so fulfilled so there's a experience now after that in the next series krishna describes more here so this 20 it's almost a 20 to 23 is describing the experience here krishna describes the vision at the end of the journey now what is the difference between the experience and the vision i need to explain this but uh, say it's like somebody says somebody goes for say mayapur uh, camp and after that how was the camp oh it was wonderful it was ecstatic it was beyond words it was the most memorable experience of my life yeah all that is good but what did you see is it say what is describing the experience oh you know we saw the magnificent uh, planetarium temple we saw the ganga we saw the beautiful deities of radha madhav so one is describing our experience the other is describing our vision and these two are broadly related with two aspects of meditation when people use the word meditation they have two things in mind meditation can be associated with the mode of thinking and meditation can be associated with the object of thought so for example somebody may say that i am meditating on this subject what that means is i am just thinking deeply about that subject isn't it i am meditating which job i should take i am meditating which ashram should i enter into so this is mode of thinking means it broadly refers to meditating is used of the deep thinking and when you talk about object of thought that means the focus is on i am meditating on krishna i am meditating on the sky i am mm. uh, meditating suppose we go on a mountain top and then we look at the natural scenery i yeah? meditating on that so meditation can have two different aspects to it how we are thinking and what we are thinking about and for most people nowadays when people practice meditation now they are concerned not so much about the object of thought they are concerned more about how it affects my thinking and in that sense what happens is when when the mode of thinking okay let's put it put the frame when the mode of thinking is the priority then what happens with respect to the object of thought or object we can say of meditation in this case with respect to object of meditation people become omnivorous you know what is omnivorous sorry anything yes omnivorous means you eat anything so omnivorous means people say that okay whether you meditated on the image of krishna or you meditated on some candle or you meditate on some circle with a light or you meditate on the sound of silence whatever that means <laughs> <laughs> the point is their concern is that we i i want to calm my mind i just want to calm my mind and in some ways what happens is if people focus their mind on anything there is there are guided meditations where somebody will tell you close your eyes and take a deep breath and imagine that you are on the banks of a, the ganga river in the rishikesh you can see the river flowing gently on the other side there is a majestic mountain 
and you can see lush greenery on the mountain beyond that there is a blue skyline and from the river a fresh breeze is coming on your face you inhale gently deeply you are feeling calm you are feeling relaxed you are feeling at peace with the universe you are in samadhi <laughs> so now actually people feel very calm by this and for so what they are concerned about is i just want to calm my thinking so now in one sense any okay let's continue over here any object of meditation so any object can actually help a person come to sattva the mind is wandering here and there it's in rajas and tamas and if we come to sattva one of the characters of sattva is sattvam sukhe sanjay one feels peaceful the two characters of sattva the one is clarity and the other is happiness so sattva will bring these two things and naturally when there is clarity and there is joy that a overall result is we feel better we feel peaceful so in that sense any object of meditation can help people to feel better but that does not mean all objects of meditation are equal in their value there are some objects that will elevate more than others that will come to but so what krishna is doing over here is first he describes the experience and he says that what is the nature of that experience he says one experience is such sublime happiness he gives two characteristics of the state of samadhi among many but two defining characteristics yatro paramate chittam niruddham yoga sevaya yatr chaiva atmanatmanam pashyan atmai tushyati sukham atyantikam yattat buddhi grahayam atindriyam vetti yatr na chaivayam sitas chalitatah so we'll look at the last verse in this or the second last verse so krishna says yam labdhwa having attained this cha param labham that there is anything other to be gained manyate nadhikam tata the subjective experience in the state of samadhi is so fulfilling that one no longer has any hankering for anything else so one of the characteristic of that state of samadhi is no more hankering yam labdha cha param labham yam labdha cha param labham मन्यते नाधिकं ततः मन्यते नाधिकं ततः एंड देन द नेक्स्ट पार्ट इज यस्मिन् स्थितो व्हेन मन इज सिचुएटेड लाइक दिस दुखेन न दुखेन इवन विद ग्रेट डिस्ट्रेस सो इट्स इंटरेस्टिंग कृष्णा इज सेइंग नॉट दैट डिस्ट्रेस विल नॉट कम बट व्हेन डिस्ट्रेस कम्स न दुखेन गुरुणा अपि व्हेन इज लार्ज डिस्ट्रेस न विचार्यते वन विल नॉट बी डिस्टर्बड बाय इट so this is uh, the there is freedom from lamenting that okay things will go wrong in the world but they don't matter so much so yasmin sthito na dukhena yasmin sthito na dukhena guruna api vichalyate guruna api vichalyate so you know we can think we all have certain goals and dreams in our life you know we may okay i want to become wealthy i want to become famous uh i want to maybe do this service i want to do that all those are they may be good goals but what goal can actually guarantee us these two things that i'll be once i achieve this i won't be craving for anything else in my life it's it's very rare there always we oh i want this i want this i want that will keep us dissatisfied and then oh if this goes wrong See, generally speaking, the more people achieve, the more are their fears, because there's a the fear of losing what they have achieved. So that is the difference between external achievement and internal achievement. That external achievement, the problem with 
external achievement is that it is you always more to be achieved and not always more but it keeps us dissatisfied it keeps us craving and there is always fear that it may be taken away and because of that now this doesn't mean one shouldn't pursue material achievement but just means that if one is pursuing material achievement as the primary or exclusive goal of one's life then the person is setting them up for setting themselves up for disappointment in the contra in contrast if there is internal achievement then the result of this is that it is enriching just getting that is itself so fulfilling that it is it is so, it's so enriching that there is no more dissatisfaction and second is that it is inalienable inalienable means it cannot be stolen from us once it is ours it is ours so that that's why prabhupada said this is the international society for krishna consciousness so once our consciousness becomes completely sheltered in krishna then there is there is no going away from it there is no loss and that's the state of perfection so there are many different people who can have different kinds of what they call as spiritual experiences and somebody can even <coughs> sing some names of some so called some baba or something you now there are there are demi gods and there are semi gods <laughs> say me that means what i am god treat me as god so whatever it is and sometimes people may chant their name and they may also feel good about it so yes anything anything if we focus the mind on that can help us feel good because it, it just focusing the mind on any one thing can raise the mind to satvaguna but the problem is say this kind of meditation when one does okay you visualize the himalayas and everything you feel good but after you come out of the meditation and what happens still the anger is there the jealousy is there the lust is there all of it comes back so basically if it is so there is meditation and its effect on the mind one can be pacification of the mind and the other is purification of the mind so pacification is possible often with any object when the mind is agitated just focus the mind on one object it will become pacified but the problem with pacification it is temporary purification <coughs> requires a divine object it requires ultimately krishna why because krishna is pure and purifying now there is a difference between this is lasting that is not fleeting what exactly happens when we meditate on krishna there are two reasons why this divine object is different from other objects one is that krishna is pure and purifying just meditating on krishna om apavitra pavitro va sarva avastham gato piva yah smareta pundari kaksham sa bahya abhyantara shuchihi shuchi one gets cleansed so now can we say that uh, meditating on the on the flame of a candle will be purifying like that well there is nothing intrinsically that within that candle's flame that can decrease our lust or anger or greed or whatever but krishna he is divine he is free from these he can free us and not only that krishna is actually uh krishna is not a passive krishna is not a passive point of meditation he 
is an active person with reciprocation. That Krishna is a person who already loves us, who cares for us. And he wants us to come to him. So that is a categorical difference. When we are trying to meditate on Krishna, then it is Krishna who is drawing us towards him. We can't say that the if somebody is meditating on some, some circle or something like that, that a point, a central dot in a circle, they can't really say, or oh, somebody is meditating on a flower on opposite wall. We can't say that the flower is consciously trying to pull their consciousness and heart towards it. No. Because the flower is just, a, either it's not even a real flower, it's a replica of a flower. But even if it's a real flower, it doesn't have that capacity. Krishna has that capacity. So, in that sense, the meditation on Krishna is distinct. And that will be the focus in the last series that Krishna does. Krishna, in the second part, he focuses on the, it focuses on the experience itself. And then he says, okay, what is giving us this experience? Or what can give us the experience the best? So, that is the described in, let's look at this verse, 730, 930. Yomam, one who sees, Pashyati, sees me everywhere. And then, Sarvam Chamai Pashyati, sees that everything is in me. Yomam Pashyati Sarvatra, Yomam Pashyati Sarvatra, Sarvam Chamai Pashyati, Sarvam Chamai Pashyati, and Krishna says, Tasyaham, that for such a person, aham, I, na pranashyati, I am never lost. And not only that, such a me na pranashyati, for me, such a person is never lost. This is the point of reciprocation. Krishna is saying that I care for this person. And that's why when we become attached to Krishna, that's inalienable. Krishna will take responsibility. Krishna will ensure that we don't become lost. Now, of course, we may say while we are in the material world, we can be lost. But we are talking about a stage of a very high purification. And we will explain that. Tasyaham na pranashyami Tasyaham na pranashyami Sacha me na pranashyati Sacha me na pranashyati Okay, together. Yomam pashyati sarvatra Sarvam chamai pashyati Tasyaham na pranashyami so now at this point, Krishna is still talking about the yogis. And the yogis generally, they begin with some external object. That is fine. So Krishna is going to talk about two external objects. He talks about that you can focus on the tip of the nose. Nasigra, Nasikagramsa. That, that's what initially you can focus on. And then or he says between the, the space between the eyebrows. And there's nothing specifically sacred about these things. There could be some energy associated with it, but that's not the key point of Krishna. Krishna is saying just start with some external focus and then start going inwards. Start going inwards. Now the yogis at this stage, when they're starting the path of yoga, they don't know what is the reality inside. For them, they discover the reality. When gradually they turn their consciousness inwards and they go deep within, then they discover that there is the Lord inside the Dhyana, Vastita Tadgate, Namanasa, Pashanti Yam Yogi. No, they see that the Lord is present, Pashanti. So, what Krishna is saying here? Yomam Pashanti Sarvatra. So, this is the vision of Krishna. So, from an external object, the yogis, they move towards the, what they call as the... Um, they have then a conceptual object. Conceptual object means, uh, it's called Asamprangyat Samadhi. That means, okay, initially they may keep a fire outside, uh, like a candle flame outside. But afterwards, they try to visualize the flame inside. And after that, they just open their mind, okay? Let me see what is there. 
and then after that they perceive Vishnu inside. So it's a long process. So initially some object is used as a tool, but gradually they don't need the external tool, then just think of that object inside. Then okay, I don't need any object at all. I just want to, my consciousness is inside, now I want to explore what is inside. And then eventually they discover Vishnu inside. So like that they come to the stage of realizing the divine inside their heart. This is of course a fairly long process. But the key point over here is that Krishna very clearly mentions that it is he who is to be ultimately realized when we go through the whole process of yoga. And interestingly Krishna says again he starts that at that stage what happens? One will see everyone equally. So in general, the spiritual journey, it starts with equanimity. Equanimity means that, oh, you know, a person can praise me, a person can criticize me, doesn't matter, I am unaffected. But the, eventually it comes to the level of empathy. Empathy means, okay, you know, when this person praises me or criticizes me, I am not personally affected. But if this person is criticizing me, what's, what's, what's going on in this person's life? Maybe they are hurting, that's why they are hurting me. As they say, hurt people, hurt people. So, at this stage, it's like I am not hurt by others. And this is still true over here, but here there is additionally what? Oh, there is also a question, what has hurt them? They are hurting me because they are hurt. They are hurting. So the idea is, equanimity is, is one is unaffected. Hmm? Equanimity is you could say the state of dispassion. Passion is a lot of emotion, but empathy is the stage of compassion. And this is where Arjuna says, enough, I can't do this. So what is, what is going on over here? Arjuna says, this is impossible. So when he says, we all know this verse, where he says, my mind is chanchalamimana krishna pramati balavadruda. Now if we look at what Arjuna's life has been, if you just take it objectively, So there's an American comedian who said that I went to my therapist and he said that you know I am depressed, irritated, having some psychotic episodes of rage. I am lonely. I am having attention attention deficit disorder. Turns out I am perfectly normal. <laughs> that means that is how most people are nowadays. So, but if we look at Arjuna's description. You know, my mind is restless, my mind is mad, my mind is going wild. Pramati Balavad Drudam. Now, if we look at Arjuna's life, Arjuna has left a, led a very disciplined and composed life. When Arjuna was going to shoot the target, he says, I see nothing except the eye of the needle. So, why is Arjuna saying my mind is so restless? Is he speaking something which is not true? Is he describing his emotion at that particular moment? Is he... But then he has been discussing philosophy. If, if say our mind is restless and wild and angry and all those things, then how would we be able to actually discuss philosophy? So Arjuna has been discussing philosophy. So Arjuna's self-description his self-description, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't match with either his history, that is his past, or his present. His history, because his present, he's having a serious discussion. In the past, he has had serious discipline. That's how he has become a champion archer. 
So just to make this clear, let's look at what Arjuna's self description is. He first, uh, say, now this is the verse we know. Let's look at this verse. Chanchalam himana Krishna. Oh Krishna, the mind is restless. Now restless can be like a child. Yeah, okay. But then he says it's not just restless. It is pramati. It is mad. So restless can be like a child. But it's like pramati is wild or it's like a madman. You know, if in a mental hospital like there's a madman. You know, they can be quite dangerous. And sometimes a madman might be a weakling. But if the madman is a bodybuilder, then it's Balavad. That's even more problematic. And then Drudam, if sometimes the person is very obstinate. I want this, I want this now and I don't care what it takes. Then it's a fearsome thing indeed, isn't it? So, Dealing with such a person would be very, very difficult. Chanchalam himana Krishna. Chanchalam himana Krishna. Pramathi balavadrudham. Pramathi balavadrudham. And Krishna is saying, Tas, Arjuna is saying, Tasya aham. That mind. Nigraham manye. Controlling it is. Vayor sudushkaram. It's like controlling the wind. I say if we are doing some, reading some newspaper or something in the in a garden and suddenly a gust of wind comes. You can try to catch the paper, but how can we catch the wind? So he's saying, trying to stop. It is like that. Tasyaham nigraham manye Tasyaham nigraham manye Vayo riva sudushkaram Vayo riva sudushkaram So together. Chanchalam dhimana Krishna Pramati balavadriham so here, when Arjuna is saying this, what is he actually referring to? Because this doesn't seem to be the way he has ever lived in his life. Actually, even when Draupadi was being dishonored, you know, Yudhishthir was completely devastated. What have I done? What is happening? And Bhima was enraged. Bhima at one point was so enraged, he told Arjuna, Arjuna, this wicked Yudhishthir is the cause of the great pain that the chase Draupadi is suffering. Arjuna, get fire. I am going to burn the hands of Yudhishthir with which he gambled Panchali away. Now, both of them are elder brothers. What does he do? Now Arjuna is very calm. Now Arjuna knows that you cannot calm Bhima down in this mood. Hey, tell Bhima, cool down. Hey, how can you speak like this with your elder brother? That's not going to work. So Arjuna very expertly says, Oh Bhima, do you want to speak words that are giving so much joy to Duryodhan? And Bhima looks at Duryodhan. Duryodhan is really happy. And Bhima becomes quiet after that. <laughs> so, this was Duryodhan's actually aim. His aim was to somehow try to split the Pandavas. And when Bhima saw that, he controlled his anger. So, the point I'm making is Arjuna is a very cool headed person. So, what is he exactly talking about when he's saying, My mind is so wild and restless? So he is basically talking about this two verses. See, the, in the previous verse he says, the problem is Samyena Madhusudana. He says, Yoyam Yoga Stvaya Proka, the path of yoga that you told me, it requires Samyu. It requires equality. And he says, Napashyami, I can't do that. So what is he saying? I can't do, especially for him, he is saying that equal vision towards Yudhishthir and Duryodhan is impossible for him. So he is applying that to his context. And he is saying, if I try to see Yudhishthir and Duryodhan equally, my mind just rages out of control. It is just not possible. It's like say, somebody has hurt us terribly. And we go and complain to authority or at least report to authority. 
no this person spoke so terribly to me and then uh, that authority tells us okay go and apologize to him it is what it is that person who has hurt me it's like every fabric of our being is no i will not do this <laughs> So, for for Arjuna Yudhishthir is an object of respect, and he says, "How can I see Yudhishthir and Duryodhan equally? If that is what is required for this path, of this path, I can't do it." So, for Arjuna, when Krishna describes the path of yoga, the physical aspect of yoga is not very difficult for him. He has grown up in a forest. So he's lived in the forest. He has performed tapasya also to get celestial weapons. That time he did some yogic meditation. But the samyena aspect, seeing both equally, and this is what Krishna said right in the beginning in six point nine, and that's what he says in six point thirty two. Six point nine is which is you start solitary meditation by that suhrun mitra re udasi na madhyasadveshi bandhushu sadhushwa piche paapeshu samabuddhir vishishyate. That friends, enemies, neutrals, you should see equally. that even those who are pious and those who are impious we should see equally now for arjuna this is not just abstract philosophical knowledge arjuna is thinking how it relates to my life and for him sadhu and papa that sadhu is yudhishthir papeshu is duryodhan and he says i just cannot see both of them equally now how will he be able to see both of them equally if he has become so detached from the world that whether in this world fair things happen unfair things happen the world has become so small is yes, in this world unfair things will keep happening and fair things will keep happening sometimes whatever i don't care for it he says i am not at that level i cannot see it that way and on top of that finally when arjuna krishna says that you should actually the those who are spiritually advanced he says you should be thinking that that actually duryodhan is hurting he says no let's throughout his life he has been hurting us so for me to think that he is hurting and that's why he is hurting us no maybe that is true but that i cannot focus on so this equal vision he says my mind starts rebelling at that time so it is not he is not talking about a steady state of the mind it is specifically his state of mind is describing self description of wild mind that is basically a response to the call for equal vision when he is told you should have a equal vision towards yudhishthir that's what he is applying it yudhishthir and duryodhan sadhushwa and papeshu so that he says is impossible and 6.9 when arjuna hears this okay he hears it let it pass but then when in 6.32 it comes again then he says that this is not possible now when arjuna says this krishna in one sense responds in a very non specific way krishna says yes arjuna it's very difficult asamshay mahabha See when somebody is coming and telling us, now oh, this is extremely difficult. Say, yeah, it's easy. What's the big deal? Why are you making some fuss about such a big thing, such a small thing? Now then that will lead to a disconnect. So when Arjuna is worked up about it, Krishna says, okay, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, it's difficult, and it is true, it is difficult. Asamchayam mahabaho. So our Krishna is actually exhibiting empathy over here himself. He's demonstrating. He says, be empathic towards others. He shows you empathy. Yes, it is difficult, but then he says. it is possible by abhyas and vairagya now broadly speaking abhyas and vairagya it can just mean do's and don'ts isn't it do's don'ts so it is a very non specific thing krishna is not saying here that you have to practice dhyan yoga only a- any path that you follow it will have certain do's and don'ts if you go back to the medical metaphor whether one path follows allopathy or ayurveda or naturopathy every path will have some do's and don'ts so krishna is giving a non specific reply he says that yes 
it will be mm, it is possible and then he emphasizes that but if you don't practice any process so it is in non specific all processes will require this they will involve these two things the next was krishna said but if you don't follow up any process if you then you can never control your mind so then, now arjuna has two concerns you remember yesterday i talked about generally when there are obstacles there are any anything we are trying to do there are two concerns that we have they both start from d and end with y you remember we discussed yesterday there is difficulty and there is delay yeah how much effort will it require how long will it take so arjuna's question in 63334 is about difficulty then after that in the next question so 3536 krishna answers briefly and then 37 to 39 arjuna will say what if it takes too long that is the essential question now before we go to that question what krishna will do is this non specific he leaves it over here he says yes you have to practice and you have to be detached but right? in the 7th chapter he will introduce bhakti yoga and in the 8th chapter he will compare bhakti yoga and dhyan yoga and there in 8.14 this is the only place in the gita where krishna says this process is easy tasyaham sulabha partha so that 8.14 is actually an answer to arjuna's concern over here so like a patient the patient says you know this treatment is not possible a doctor may say yeah okay and you know if you just follow the do's and don'ts it will work but okay if this treatment is not possible is there some other treatment like if some patient uh, uh, can't go to under surgical surgery then okay then maybe there some other treatment maybe we can we can give intravenous we can do this we can do that so that will come so krishna will talk about that later now when arjuna says what if it takes too long what if i take to the spiritual path but i am not able to realize by the end of my life so or if it takes so long that in this life itself i become discouraged and i give up both ways are possible but generally is talking about it just takes too long so now this is where krishna will answer the question and this will take a, about 10 15 minutes but I'll, this is very important section which which will conclude this chapter so um, generally speaking uh, when there's a question mm -hmm. mm. there is every question there is the head and there is the heart the head is concerned with reason with logic the heart is concerned with emotion mm. so now what happens is for different people in different contexts there may be different things going on so somebody says you know i don't think i can chant 16 rounds now they, you know it could be that practically from a logistical perspective that they are so busy they don't have so much time or it could be that they just feel this is too demanding i can't do it they don't have the confidence both are possible so depending on what is going on in that person's mind either the head has to be addressed or the heart has to be addressed. ideally both have to be addressed generally a good answer will provide enlightenment enlightenment is this is how we can do it and it will provide encouragement both are required if if you consider you know in answering if we only enlighten what happens is that person will say yeah this is how we should do it that person will feel impractical this is what i should do but i can't do it but if we only encourage You say okay if somebody says how can i trek up this mountain yeah, you can do it you can do it well i need a map i know i can do it isn't it 
So only encourage, then it will be that person will be ill-equipped. Sometimes people need some tangible guidance. So ideal answer has both enlighten and encourage. And depending on the state of the mind of the person, either enlightenment has to come first and then oh, you can do it, come on, all the best. Or sometimes first, the encouragement has to come. So Krishna sees Arjuna's state of mind and the first thing that he does is he offers encouragement. And this is one of the sweetest verses in the Bhagavad Gita. Most reassuring verses. So, Krishna tells Arjuna, O Partha, na iha na amutra, not in this world nor in the next world. Vinashas tasya vidyate. The person who is practicing yoga, that person will not meet with any kind of disaster in this world or the next world. Partha naiveha na mutra. Partha naiveha na mutra. Vinashas tasya vidyate. Vinashas tasya vidyate. Then he says, no, he certainly not. Kalyana Krutkashit. That one who is, Kalyana Krut means one who is trying to do good. Here, good refers to one who is trying to grow spiritually. That is a nishriyas, that is long term good. Kashit, Kashit means even slightly. Durgatim Tat Gachiti. So not only will they not have destruction, that is Vinash. Durgati is some kind of misfortune or degradation. Neither of those will happen. Nahi Kalyana Krut Kashche Nahi Kalyana Krut Kashche Durga Tinta Ta Gachati Durga Tinta Ta Gachati Together Patha Nahi Reha Namutra Vinashastasya Vidyate Nahi Kalyana Krut Kashche Durga Tinta Ta Gachati So here Krishna is assuring Arjuna that if you practice this path of transcendence, so then you will never meet with destruction. So now again, what here an important thing to notice that, like I said, the word yoga has contextual meanings. Sometimes it refers to karma yoga. Sometimes it yoga refers to dhyan yoga. Sometimes it just refers to spiritual path. That yoga bhavati dukkha by the spiritual practice you will become free from distress. So now, in this context, when Krishna will use the word yoga and yogi, he is referring to a generic, generic spiritual seeker. That person may be seeking through karma yoga, that means through jnana yoga, dhyana yoga, bhakti yoga, it applies to all of them. So what does he say over here? That there are broadly two trajectories possible. That if a person practices yoga and Basically, what he is saying is, let's try to depict this. This is the earthly level. This is the heavenly level. And then this is the spiritual level. So, you could say these, this exists within the universe. And that is beyond the universe. So, earth and heaven. Now, if somebody is living here, most of the society in the past, past was on the path of Karmakand. Living piously by which they will go to heaven. So that was the standard trajectory. Most people would live with Punya. And that's why in traditional society when somebody has departed, they say the person is Swargavasi. Now, whether the person is actually Swargavasi, it depends. But if a person has lived piously, that is the understanding. Now, Krishna is saying, so this is the normal path for most people. Now, the path of, this is the path of yoga. By yoga, we seek to go beyond this world to the spiritual world. So, now, Arjuna is saying that I may give up this path and I may come here to go towards this path. So, it's like he, he is saying that, okay, I am living as a Kshatriya and Kshatriyas, they fight heroically, they live virtuously and then by such a life, they will go to heaven. 
So he says somebody leaves this path and goes to the other path. And what if they can't stick to the other path for long enough? Then will they get lost? So Krishna says no. That means he said, what does he say? That now when somebody leaves this path and goes on that path, they could be at this level or they could be at this level. What does it mean? At this level, they still have material desires. They still have desires for material enjoyment. Here, they have, they have gone beyond material desires to a large extent. So this is, this is possibility one. This is possibility two. So basically, the person's journey ends in the, in the sense that that person uh, runs out of time. There, so then in such a situation, Krishna says there are two trajectories possible. So for the first person, for the first person who still has some material desires, so Krishna says they will go to heaven and they will live abundantly in heaven and then they will be reborn on earth in a prosperous or a pious family and thereby they can again begin their journey towards yoga. So the idea is that if somebody had material desires then they will have abandoned fulfillment of those material desires and after that so the desires were distracting them okay the desires are abundantly fulfilled then they come back to earth and when they are born on earth also see in earth one can get distracted by desires or one can get distracted by distresses so there's too much trouble it's difficult to practice bhakti in the west if there's too much material prosperity it's difficult to practice bhakti but say if in the east somebody is in the place like Ukraine or somewhere, it's too much disturbance. It will be difficult to practice bhakti. So Krishna says they will be born in a relatively undisturbed, materially undisturbed place. So they don't have to worry too much about livelihood. Generally when we worry about livelihood, it is either because you don't have money or you have too many desires. So that means we have enough but we have so many desires. But if somebody is born in a pious, prosperous family, Shuchinam Shrimatam Gehe. And that person can resume their spiritual journey. So what they have achieved is not lost, Krishna says. Now the other path, other possibility is that the person is, so this is for a, you could say, um, as I said, the case one, the yogi with material desires still. Now the other case is when the yogi does not have material desires, then Krishna brings a little more subtlety that at the earth itself like we say among humans there are 8.4 million species so among the on the earth itself there are spiritually unevolved beings people and there are spiritually evolved people so this so this yogi after this life will be born to a as a child to a spiritually evolved couple and by this what will happen is it is born to a as a child to a spiritually evolved couple then right from the beginning itself that person can resume their spiritual journey so from here it's like they get a head start because the head start the parent itself very much support and encourage and facilitate the spiritual journey. So in this way Krishna is saying a person is never loses their spirituality. This is the second possibility. And then how exactly is the spiritual journey resumed? What does that mean practically? Krishna says Purva Bhyasena Tenaiva Riyate Yava Shopisa that by one's past practice, one is naturally attracted. So, see there is, with respect to our knowledge, in the philosophy of knowledge, they said that, you know, there is, there is knowledge that is articulated knowledge. That means what we can explain. 
and beyond that much bigger is embodied knowledge embodied knowledge means that is very much in our being say like some children may be playing a game and now if a new child comes and starts playing the game and that child breaks a rule the kids may say you can't do it you should, you should not do like this now the kids may not be able to tell exactly what is the rule you are breaking say, this is not to be done so say for example we if we know a particular language now if somebody speaks in a slightly different way so they speak something grammatically off you say it's not to be spoken like this so it's spoken like this what is the rule over here we may not know the rule so we are not able to articulate what is right or what is wrong but it's embodied it just naturally comes to us so when we say spiritual knowledge or that that spiritual impressions are carried over from the this life to the next life it is not in the form of articulated knowledge it's more in the form of embodied knowledge that means it is not that that's why krishna uses the word riyate ya avasho pisah a person is almost helplessly attracted normally avasha helpless has a negative connotation but here avasha does not mean so much helpless which has a negative connotation it means spontaneous nobody has to tell that person and that person cannot themselves also explain why i am feeling attracted like this but they are just drawn drawn towards spirituality and by this so that person resumes their spiritual journey and across the world i meet so many different devotees who whose spiritual journey is so amazing how it starts off i met one devotee who is now sanskrit scholar he said he came on a tour of india it was like a cultural exchange kind of tour and then he came to some place in i think was, he came to varanasi or somewhere and then he went to library and he saw oh no it was not varanasi i think it was some which is which is a place where western people come a lot he came to be came to rishikesh or wherever so he came to some place and he just went to a library and he saw a sanskrit book just opened it and he said i just fell in love with the script i said this is like mathematical symbols you know sanskrit if you write in english and all oh, he said this is fascinating i have to learn this i was say who can get attracted by looking at the script like that <laughs> but that is ova abhyasena te nahi so it's almost a mystical attraction so when we are trying to share bhakti with others we try to rationally present bhakti and rationally also the case can be made and that person can take up but some people just take up so enthusiastically because it's not just our rational presentation that is attracting them there is something mystical is being awakened within them so it is not that if a child, if a person was very spiritually advanced in the next life when they are born it is not that they will be born instead of crying and chanting hari krishna <laughs> no there there is a biological aspect that is there as natural <laughs> but they will have an almost mystical attraction towards the spiritual and that attraction will pull them towards spirituality and they are passing by a temple and they hear some kirtan the child will tell parents i want to go here and parents no we don't have to. i want to go here somebody hear some have I know so many western devotees also they said that among everything that attracts us about india it's the recitation of the shlokas it's just so amazing it just pulls us in so what is happening is it's quite like there's a purva abhyas in the day there is some attraction from the previous life so it's not articulated in the sense that they can't rationally explain okay what is going on why am i attracted like this but it is it is embodied it is just naturally felt like that if you read the uh, memo uh, memoirs of several of the prabhupada's disciples if you read the journey home you know radhanath maharaj also says this that that what was it that was pulling me away from home that was pulling me like this i couldn't explain it myself but something beyond me that was pulling me and it's his experience his book has become very famous but it's not just his book there are many others also 
many others who were spiritual seekers like that. And the point is this, this is how Krishna draws us. So Krishna assures Arjuna that whatever practice we have done, it will not be lost, will never be lost. And finally, he comes back to his point. The point at which Arjuna asked the question was, Krishna says that the topmost vision is to have the vision of me and to see everyone is connected with me. So Krishna says that among all spiritual seekers, because he is not just not talking about the spiritual seeking, he says, Tapasvibhyodiko yogi jnani bhyopimatodika karmibhyashadiko yogi tasmad yogi bhava arjuna. So he says that you become, becoming a yogi is very good. And then, and finally he says, the topmost yogi is one who fixes their mind on me. The topmost yogi is one whose entire being is immersed in me. So, yogi naam api He says, there are various spiritual seekers among the, and the yogis are best. But among the yogis, who are the best yogis? Sarvesham madgate nantaratmana. Those who are able to see me inside. And not just see me, shraddhavan bhajate yoma. They worship me with shraddha. And this, this sec, the third line is significant because there are some yogis who see Krishna in their heart and they think I am that Krishna and they have to merge into it. But that is, then there is no bhajan over there. There is, there is, there is merging. But when he says that they worship with shraddha, that means they have no urge to merge. Shraddha van bhajate yoma. Krishna says, Same yukta tamomata. Such people are most intimately united with me. And this verse of the yogis who are most intimately united with him will become the takeoff point for the bhakti section. Where Krishna will tell that there is another way to get to this stage of having the mind absorbed in me, and that path <coughs> is the path of direct bhakti yoga, which will begin the next section of the Gita, which we'll be discussing in our next session. So, I'll summarize what we discussed today. So, in chapter 6, overview that we did, we started by <coughs> primarily talking about how Krishna is addressing Arjuna's concern. Now, Arjuna has this question that, is unasked question, that is renunciation never to be done? You are saying that engaged action, in detached action is better. So Krishna says, that's what Krishna says, from Karma Yoga, he will talk about Dhyan Yoga. But before that he says, to do this, what is the key thing? The mind has to be calm. Normally the mind is calmed by both the individual and society. But if a person is practicing solitary meditation, then it is vital for them to have the mind beyond duality, at least to some extent. So duality can come because of things or it can come because of people. And both of these, they need to be, so it's like, if the yogi is here, initially the world of matter is very big, the world of spirit is small. But for the yogi to actually renounce the world, the world of matter needs to become small and the world of spirit needs to be so this is the stage where a person can become Arudha. Arudha means a person can begin the journey to renounce the world. And then we discussed about how yoga is a gradual outside in process. So first there is bodily regulation and then gradually there is mental concentration. So, but in between there is a shutting off of externals. So, this can be done in the world, but this has to be done by renouncing the world. So, Pratyahar is the break between this. And when there is mental concentration with respect to meditation, it can be based on the mode of thinking or it can be based on the object of thought. So any mode of thinking can actually bring pacification. Because you just focus on one thing, the restless mind will become pacified. But only when it is Krishna, that will bring purification. 
that is because first of all krishna is himself pure and secondly because krishna reciprocates with us he is not just an insentient object that we are choosing to meditate point that we are choosing to meditate he is a person and then when krishna describes about the spiritual journey uh, from seeker to seer krishna describes it first in terms of the experience the characteristic of the experience is that there is at the stage of samadhi a person is free from hankering and lamentation and lamenting that yam labdha cha param lav and he also describes it in terms of the vision so vision is to see krishna everywhere and everything in krishna krishna is the highest reality so in that way krishna is addressing actually both these aspects of meditation then we discussed about arjuna's first question so that was about the mind keeping it equal he says is impossible so he is referring this basically to seeing duryodhan and yudhishthir equally that is impossible he said so he is objecting to the mental aspect of yoga hmm. and krishna replies by basically saying that he gives a non specific non specific reassurance that yes by practice and detachment is possible and then lastly we discussed about the second question was that what if it takes so this question was about the difficulty level and the second question was about delay and in that krishna says that there is never either destruction or any kind of degradation neither is there so what krishna is doing is first he is offering encouragement then he offers enlightenment in enlightenment we discuss the two trajectories how the person may go either to heavens and then return and continue on and then continue on the spiritual journey it's through heavens the other is a person on the earth itself who is born in a higher family and then from there they continue on their spiritual journey so essentially krishna assures that actually whatever we have acquired that that knowledge which is like the embodied knowledge it is already there within us even if we can't articulate it that will spontaneously attract us towards the spiritual and by that we will we will resume our spiritual journey and krishna will conclude by talking about the topmost yogi is absorbed in him is centered on krishna and that will lead to the next chapter so thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna are there any questions yes uh prabhu in the meditation part uh, while folk are meditating putting on the form of krishna uh, you told like the first reason is like he is pure and he purifies us so can you please elaborate on this and i uh, don't really understand it a bit so can you please imp- uh, tell like what are the impurities in mind and how meditating on krishna they get purified okay mm. krishna is transcendental any other object that we meditate on is not transcendental so when we link with him at a transcendental level krishna enters into our object and when the into our into our consciousness and the bhagavatam uses the example that salilasya tha sharat that if the water in a river is dirty uh, it's very difficult for us to take bucket by bucket all remove all the dirty water but when rains come then all the dirty water gets swept away and the river becomes crystal clear so like that for us when we bring krishna into our consciousness then it's like a it's like a flow of pure consciousness that comes in so what are the impurities lust anger greed basically it is ultimately like we discuss impurity is misdirected desire hmm? so when we connect with krishna as krishna's all attractiveness gets revealed to us then the impure desires are replaced by pure desires so that all attractiveness of krishna 
that plays a key factor in purifying us. So Krishna purifies because what happens is his all attractiveness, his all attractiveness, change or yeah, you can say changes our desires. Basically, bhakti pareshan bhav virakti ranyatracha. When we experience Krishna, it uh, triggers, no, induces, you could say, induces spiritual desires. And when the spiritual desires are induced, Krishna is so sweet, Krishna is so wonderful, Krishna is so attractive, then that basically sidelines or eventually exiles material desires. So essence of purification is basically anartha nivritti and anartha pravritti. The anarthas go down and the attraction to Krishna increases. Okay. Prabhuji, in yoga, uh, we see, like I have uh, read and heard about uh, like the mystic powers and uh, all that in uh, Ashtam Yoga and and these, yeah. but, but science like refutes this. Uh, and is there any scientific basis to this? Like, I think my journey home also, Radhanath Swami Maharaj uh, describes and uh, that. But, like, is there scientific basis to it on how it explains these phenomena? Well, two things mm. with respect to mystic powers. The key point is that you know, science works on the premise of controlled experiments. That is the basic premise. Premise means the foundation. That we create a situation where we control what all is going on in that situation. And then we experiment with it. So for example, if we mix an acid and a base, then what's going to happen? So this is red, this is blue. We make sure that only those two elements are mixing together. And then we may get a green required. And then anywhere somebody might do it, it will happen. But if you can't control the experiment, if this has some contaminant, contaminant, if that has some other element within it, then the result will not come. So science works by, control, by, by having controlled experiments. Now the problem with anything spiritual, hmm, especially something centered on God, that is not subject to human control. And sometimes we, that's why we use the word science of Krishna consciousness, or science of spirituality, Prabhupada uses that. And Prabhupada is using that more in a systematic body of knowledge. It's a rational body of knowledge. But if we literally want to adopt the scientific method, we can't do a controlled experiment. Because the whole point of, you can say spirituality is an experiment. But an experiment in which we surrender control. Not that we take control. Isn't it? So the method is opposite. Now sometimes you may say that our consciousness is like a lab. And we are bringing Krishna into our consciousness. That There is some little truth to that. But it is, first of all we don't know what is inside this lab. What all anathas are there in it? What all conditionings are there? And we can't demand Krishna to come on control. Come on plan. You know, I chanted this many rounds, now you have to come here. <laughs> so, the basic premise of spirituality is that God is beyond human control. And that's why you can't, we can't do a controlled experiment. Now, broadly, there are some aspects of spirituality that have been established. Say, for example, if you chant Hare Krishna, the sattva guna in people increases. Hmm? Maybe that they, they, how they're definitely depressed, they have some addictive desires, those go down. And that has been proven. So, so spirituality has a, a empirical side and a non-empirical side. So empirical side means that which can be measured that which can be controlled. The non-empirical side is that which cannot be controlled. 
so for example nowadays scientists are trying to study the brain waves or the brain states or when people meditate now what they have found is that those parts of the brain which are associated with the person being calm so there is like they say that we have those synapses which are formed between the various brain cells and to the extent they are clean synapses then the transmission of information goes very clearly but there is crosstalk crosstalk means that's when we get distracted that means the synapses are connecting like this they connect like this also so basically then there is distraction a person can't focus so they found that the crosstalk among the brain cells <coughs> that decreases when some one hears some ragas when one uh, chants some mantras so what we can perceive the brain states are empirical but the content of consciousness is non empirical what do i mean by that I say by the brain states to some extent whatever neuroscience we have has understood and we assume what neuroscience has understood is true now somebody may say okay you are feeling happy right Now that may be true, but no amount of probing the brain can tell tell what am I thinking of that has made me happy. Is it so? That is not exactly empirical. You can say happiness is empirical in the sense of expression on the face, but what is the content of the experience? That no amount of probing of the brain can tell. So this is a this is. this is a limitation of the scientific method scientific method specifically in the sense of the method involving control experimentation so the content of consciousness that is not even accessible for us or to speak of controlling it so with respect to mystic powers now while some yogis may have some mystic powers and generally if they have those mystic powers they can exhibit them at will but among those who are serious yogis they understand that this is this is not my doing this is there is something higher happening over here i have got some higher blessing and whether those yogic powers can be subjected to control experimentation and whether that can reveal something that depends there was some story in the news about some some yogi who had not eaten or food or water for many many months or even years and they put that person in i can find that reference Does anyone know about this story pralaj jani name is the pralaj 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 jani yeah so so i think that that's a, that's a reasonably well documented story now what they say is that somehow in his body when urine is formed that urine is reabsorbed into the body and somehow it, it is not contaminating or sickening the body so they are what they can find is biologically speaking uh, a person cannot survive without food or water hmm? but now all that they can find is biological mechanism the body will not live without water but where is the water coming from so water is being reabsorbed in the body and how is it getting purified how is it not causing contamination that is difficult for them to figure so there are some things which could be done as controlled experiments now generally speaking the yogis who have mystical powers they are not so interested in demonstrating those powers uh and those who are interested in demonstrating their powers often don't really have powers is it it's it they want to just uh, they do some tricks it's like so can mystic powers be just like a magic show it's possible that somebody might be just a magician and tricking people into believing that is actually there but can there be actual powers that's also possible so so the, the problem is this, this is the, if these powers come from a higher source and you say everything comes from a higher source you know even say somebody singing ability comes from a higher source somebody speaking ability comes from a higher source that is true but there are certain gifts which are normal and they are relatively speaking under greater control of people if somebody has extraordinary singing ability it's not that every single time they sing it is going to be extraordinary but on an average it will be above average because they have such <laughs> because they have such extraordinary ability what they say for example sports they say that 
form may be temporary but class is permanent that sometimes even a good batsman may not be able to bat well but the way they conduct themselves even if they get out the shots that they hit they are there is a class to their batting so there is there can be the wavering in it but there is a basic foundation that remains steady so but with this very yogic power mystic powers it's it's very much in the domain of extraordinary the realm of control that we humans have I mean, even the yogi, how much control they have over their powers and how much they would want that to be subject to control experiments is difficult to know. Now, having said that, there is much in modern science that points to something beyond the normal laws of physics. So, there's a whole domain of sixth sense. Uh, now, it's called in different ways, but there, there is a well-known experiment called the staring experiment. You can Google that. You know, that basically, like say, we all sometimes feel somebody staring at me. We look back and then somebody is looking away. They feel embarrassed. Especially if somebody is more attractive, they have that experience quite a bit. But in general, uh, what happens is that if I am sitting here and I have to guess, is somebody staring at me? And there is a person behind me who is staring or not staring? So the possibility of I getting it right is 50%. Staring? Yes? No. Yes? No. But in general, so that person could be staring at me or looking at a book or looking somewhere else. It's a possibility. In general, almost everyone gets it right much more than 50%. 60%, 65%. And some people get it right 90, 95% also. So now, how exactly does it happen? They say that there are some nerves in our brain which, well, what do they do? Do they have the capacity of sight? How, how do they exactly perceive? There's some explanation they try to give. But... The idea that there is something more to the universe than what we perceive through our normal senses or what, what the laws of physics as we know them uh, talk about, that is something which is much more documentable. But specific yogic powers, I think significant research may be required before that can be done. To make a strong case. See, there are many anecdotal incidents, but anecdotal incidents don't they don't amount to serious scientific research. Okay. Any last question? Yes, please. The last two verses, the Tapasvi Bhyo, Yamit Bhyo and Karmi Bhyo, if they are not yogis, then what they are like, um, like? Because Krishna is saying that yogi is above this. And then in the next verse, he says that amongst all the yogis, Bhakti yogi is the highest. So, are there not uh, Karmi yogis, Jnani yogis, and Ashtami yogis? Or are they different from that? Yeah, it's a. See, the word yoga is uh, in the Bhagavad Gita used in many meanings. And now there is, like we discussed the word karma. In the word same, karma can mean action, it can mean like activity that brings the action, it can just mean inactivity also. So, there is one verse in which uh, the word yoga itself, in the same verse, it has two different meanings. I think it is a 6.23. So, I am just giving this example. Let's see. Tam vidya dukkha sanyogam viyogam yoga sangeetam. Tam vidya, know this to be the state where dukkha sanyoga viyoga. So the word yoga comes three times. Sanyoga, viyoga, yoga. So what it means over here is dukkha sanyoga. Dukkha sanyoga is the contact with distress, or it's more like the bond with the distress that we have. So in this world, we are all married to distress. <laughs> And we yoga is we can get a divorce from this marriage. <laughs> and Krishna says this divorce from this marriage to distress is what is called as yoga. So sanyoga, viyoga, yoga. So in sanyoga and viyoga, basically the yoga means connection or disconnection. But in yoga sangeeta, there yoga refers to the spiritual path of yoga and not the spiritual path of yoga. Here he's talking about the perfection in the spiritual path of yoga. Hmm. Like uh, in the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, the Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha, it is said that Yoga is the cessation of all the material movements of consciousness. 
there he is using the word yoga in the sense of perfection of yoga. So yoga can refer to the path of yoga, yoga can refer to the perfection of yoga, yoga can refer to connection, yoga can refer to a per yoga can be like a uh, refer to a particular path of Indian yoga. So yoga can have many different meanings. So we have to look at the context to understand what this means. So in this particular verse, uh, when Krishna is using the word yogi, clearly he is contrasting with his other paths. So in this sense, he is saying that uh, tapasvi, jnani, karmi are all of these spiritual seekers. My understanding of this verse is that somebody can be performing tapasya without being a spiritual seeker. Like Hiranyakashi was performing tapasya. Now karmi, I don't think Krishna uses the word karmi to refer to karma yoga. He could refer to it, no doubt about it. And I'll explain how that is also a reasonable explanation. But in the flow of the verses, Krishna is talking that basically a spiritual seeker is better than any kind of spiritual non-seeker even if they have laudable qualities. Those laudable qualities could be, they will be, they could be very, very responsible. So karmi doesn't refer simply to sense gratifier. That person could be a responsible materialist. Hmm? That person could be jnani, that person could be wise, that person could be analytical, could be philosophical. But that person would not, not, not be spiritual. That person could be very austere, disciplined. So, so in that sense, we could use this verse to mean that a spiritual seeker is better than a spiritual non-seeker, even if it's a non-seeker with many laudable qualities. Now, another way of looking at it is what you said is that Krishna is recommend or another way that these he's referring to these are, these are also spiritualists, but then he is saying among these spiritualists the yogi, then here yoga would refer to dhyan yogi. And Dhyan Yogi is better than all of these. But then if Krishna were referring to Yogi as Dhyana Yogi, then he doesn't refer in the next stage to the person specifically as a Bhakti Yogi. He's just saying they're all Yogis, but among all Yogis, the highest is one who has realized. So in that sense, from the description, we can infer it as Bhakti Yogi. But Krishna's use of the word Yoga is or Yoginamapi Sarvesham that is inclusive of Bhakti Yogi. So, if Krishna's usage of Yogi was referring specifically to Dhyan Yogi, then Bhakti Yogi would not be included in that. So, that's why the more textually consistent understanding is Yogi refers to a spiritual seeker, and among all spiritual seekers, uh, the, the seeker who has realized Krishna, who has developed devotion for Krishna or absorption Krishna is the best and a spiritual seeker is better than uh, anyone who is not a spiritual seeker even if they have some some laudable qualities which could seem to be spiritual yeah, they are not necessarily actively pursuing yoga hmm? pursuing spiritual growth so, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Gaur Bhagavad Gita.